Uh, welcome back, everyone, to the, the second uh, round table of the day. And um, yeah, my name is Amy Owen. I'm the coordinator of the Physicus project. And it is, um, yeah, I'm very proud to be here and working tightly with uh, Silvana and Operandum. And um, what we'd like to do now, this round table, we have uh, several EU funded projects here. And uh, we'd like to showcase them first. So our speakers will be presenting, and then we will move into a panel discussion where we try to um, really capture these synergies between the projects and the lessons learned between uh, newer funded projects and, and some of the projects that will be, will be ending quite soon on nature-based solutions. So uh, with that, I would like to present our first speaker. Uh, Tog McIntyre, who is an environmental uh, psychologist, and he is the coordinator of Go Green Routes. And I found a, a nice quote from, from Tag on the project website that I think offers a, a nice introduction to his presentation. Go Green Routes seeks to evoke a shift in the perception of public spaces. Please, Tag, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, it's, it's my pleasure to be here um, as a coordinator of Go Green Roots and to, to meet so many of my fellow uh, researchers in the field. Um, so Go Green Roots is a 10.48 million project working across um, uh, six targeted cities, uh, but with 40 partners. Now, just to be clear, 40 partner projects, that, that's actually more, more partners than I have Facebook friends. So it's uh, definitely a challenge to manage type of scale. And like many other projects, we also have a connection with um, uh, China through the Beijing City Lab um, and uh, with Mexico through one of our partners, ICLIA. So we're really concerned with um, what we call NBS Projects 2.0. And NBS Projects 2.0 are ones that, I guess, more holistically look at the health benefits and not just the ecological benefits. I mean, if we look at the definitions uh, of NBS, we know that we're really talking about ecology and the environment, and the language is typically framed health as a co-benefit. And, okay. So, uh, yeah, thanks for giving me the slides. Um, so, the, the um, the, in our project, what we're concerned with is actually um, that uh, health wouldn't simply be a co-benefit, would, but would be a benefit. So the primacy in our project is focused around health first and uh, environment and ecology second. And that is somewhat of a contradiction based on the, the large extant research literature we have to date. So uh, that's our approach and shared with three sister or clustered projects. Um, I'm not going to go through too much detail of what we're doing other than to highlight in the context of here today, I try to highlight three lessons learned. One's around eco-anxiety, another around nature connectedness, and the other's around virtual reality. Um, and in essence, I'll try to be very quick in this, but look, eco-anxiety is one of those things which attracts a lot of media attention. And as a psychologist, I can tell you, we're not quite sure what it is, but it appears to be a type of distress um, focused on degraded environment and the risks, not today's risks, but perhaps the future risk from climate change. It's often perhaps, you know, incorrectly associated just with young people when actually the research suggests it's intergenerational. It can be assessed using surveys, but as a psychologist, we're always, you know, always concerned about just using a survey when you can also look at behaviors, you can look at sleep or, or other measures of stress. But essentially, eco-anxiety and climate optimism can help us reframe how we think about NBS and how we can protect mental health uh, simultaneously at the same time as protecting uh, and mitigating against climate change. We highlight this, this is a core part of our project. So in NBS, what we tend to do is we focus on the implementation. And when we do that, we don't perhaps focus on people's connection to the NBS. 
whether it's placemaking, whether it's people's perceived relationship to nature, or whether it's you know how they feel about the planet and how they feel about their local park. And we're actually developing a new test to look at this because we're concerned that this is something which could be, has been somewhat overlooked in the literature. So understanding and promoting nature connectedness can provide a foundation for many sustainable behaviors. Because to date, research in this area suggests that nature connectedness is linked to pro-environmental behavior as well as well-being. This is an interesting add-on from our Norwegian partners at INN in our project. Um, we've developed a, a series of virtual reality scenarios where we can take using open um, street map software and we can add or remove green infrastructure from that environment. So you just think about it. We can paint different futures, maybe a, an apocalyptic uh, 2050 or a a really good uh, green 2030. So we can develop different scenarios and look at individuals' perceptions. And this allows us to create a virtual laboratory to test responses systematically about citizens' perceptions of the future. And just on the future, this is my last slide, just to highlight that, you know, health has many different elements. And we're suggesting that health in a more holistic way, looking at sleep, access to nature, looking at uh, air pollution, look at environmental quality. These are not entirely unrelated. And I think this interaction between ecosystem health and human health is something that needs to be focused on. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Zach. Nice. Well, then we continue with this uh, showcasing session. And I'd like to introduce uh, Darko Ferce. And he is the director of E-Institute in Slovenia. Um, not only a skilled project manager, he is also an open innovation expert. So he's here to share a relatively newly funded NBS project, Upsurge. Okay, it works. Thank you very much. Um, yes, I came from Slovenia, from A Institute. Uh, we are a coordinator of Upsearch project. Uh, it is not that big project. We have just 23 product partners. Uh, we are in the beginning of the second year of project implementation. That means that uh, the results are not there yet, or that we are quite in the beginning uh, of the phase. But we have started uh, with uh, some challenges, and one of the biggest challenges of today's life is a very fast urbanization. Each year, there is about 10,000 square kilometers of the land urbanized across the world, and this represents 100 cities like Paris. So each year, 100 cities are like Paris are built around the world. And this, of course, presents enormous pressure to the, to the environment. Uh, and these cities, basically all the cities now cover about 3% of the Earth's space, and they produce about 70% of the greenhouse em emissions. And this, of course, has negative influence on the health and on the well-being of the population. Uh, so nature-based solutions could be one of the solutions for uh, making the, la the cities more livable and also more healthy. Uh, but in many times, the decision makers doesn't know exactly what kind of nature-based solutions sh should they implement. So they have a lot of possibilities, but it's quite hard to select one. And uh, within our project, we would like uh, to help the decision-making process uh, with the building the regenerative urban lighthouse um, tool. And uh, basically, this tool would then help uh, cities, uh, cities decision makers, uh, to uh, to be able to a little bit more easier to decide which kind of nature-based solutions should they take. Um, so within the project there will be the research part we will develop the k performance indicators um, and also test some plans uh, regarding the, the air pollution uh, then we will do the living labs which which we named place labs and they would be not just uh, in the first phase they will not just help the decision makers to uh, select the nature-based solutions but they will also the very very fine nature-based solutions 
uh, not just from the environmental point, but also from the social point and from the gender issue point. Um, and uh, uh, they would be basically one part of the uh, the lighthouse system. So uh, we would like really to make nature-based solutions for the people, with the people, and for the people. Uh, we will do also the monitoring system. Monitoring system will be done with the sensors, but also with some uh, innovative aspects. For example, uh, we will use the bees for the monitoring of the pollen. Um, and at the end, we will also um, pre uh, prepare some kind of ICT tools. They will be stationary and also mobile tools where the people would be able to uh, see uh, the impacts of nature-based solutions. So we are having five cities, uh, Maribor, uh, Breda, Budapest, uh, Katowice, and Belfast. Uh, in each of these five demo cities, there will be the demonstration example of nature-based solutions. We also have two follower cities. Uh, Prato and um, <clears throat> Patras in Greece. Uh, here are some examples what it will be built. So on the uh, upper left uh, corner, you can see the example of the Budapest. And they have problems in the summer with the excessive water after the storms. And they also have problems with the excessive heat. So for example, they would like to do the rain gardens. And they would also uh, like to uh, uh, refurbish or uh, to change the part of the very broad um, uh, streets to be more green. So in the upper right corner, there is example of the Belfast. Uh, they would actually use the, some of the unused, currently unused, unused space and, uh, and uh, they will have, they will uh, prepare the gardens for the population, for the local population. And then on the bottom part, uh, you can see the Maribor example. Uh, Maribor is in Slovenia, and they, uh, there is a stream across the city which is currently totally unused, and they would like to make it more beautiful and uh, more appealing to the people. Uh, so within our um, urban regenerative lighthouse, we, have, we will have some specific uh, uh, toolbox or tools. Uh, one of the interesting one would be urban regenerative and clearing house. This will be like um, the expert tool, the experts so that will, would help the cities on the decision making. Uh, then we will have the uh, matchmaking matrix, which will help also the, to connect the cities and, uh, um, and to the other cities so that they, would, they, that they could uh, exchange the, uh, the ideas. Uh, and the na na nature-based solutions clustering network, it will be under the ECLA network of 1,750 cities, and this network will actually connect all the cities and help them a little bit with the decisions. So uh, if uh, you would like also to join the, our group, you're very welcome to, to follow us on the website and uh, you will see how, uh, the, the, how we will develop the, uh, the project in the future. So thank you very much. Thank you, Becker. Perhaps just pass the microphone to our next uh, speaker, Teresa Calone. She is a research fellow at the University of Bologna uh, with a keen interest in civic engagement, uh, co-creation, and the governance of the urban commons. So here, I really very much look forward to I change, please. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. I am really glad to be here with this um, interesting panel to speak about the I change project, especially because I was uh, um, also part as a Unibo team of the Operandum project, and I see that we uh, manage to report some lesson learned into the I change project, some challenges and some aspects that we developed in uh, Operandum uh, in this specific project. I am um, extremely interested in, in this project, per project personally because I am a sociologist and I have been always working in interdisciplinary research uh, project such as Operandum but also such as uh, I change. And the iChange project stems from the idea that the power of citizen science can contribute for, um, for a green tra transition. So it is extremely uh, important. The core uh, activity of the project is to 
let uh, citizen and stakeholder participate into the, the science activity, meaning uh, the direct collection of environmental and socioeconomic data with novel and user-friendly tools that has been experimented together with other tools, like more um, uh, precise and accurate. But the, the, the level of knowledge that the citizen science will produce together with the research part and the citizen part is aimed to raise awareness of, on the impact of climate change and um, related natural hazard, specifically at urban level. The approach that the project is, um, is promoting is the co-design uh, learning approach and uh, with the intention to improve citizen knowledge on climate change uh, impacts and help citizens understand how their behavior, how their individual and collective behavior can actually make a difference, can have an impact on the uh, response uh, on how climate change have an impact on um, uh, at urban level. On the green square, you can see the main aspects of uh, the project, with, which is uh, quite a new project, it started uh, a year ago, and um, the UNIBO um, partner is a scientific coordinator in, in this specific uh, project. The, quest, the concept, uh, um, the overall concept of eye change is how behavioral change of an individual is possible and is promoted and is supported through a citizen science initiative and how um, some, um, inf information and communication technologies can be tailored according to the, this kind of awareness. So uh, the approach and the methodology that the iChange project is using is the Living Lab, where citizens and scientists can meet together, can experiment in real life um, um, uh, the, uh, in, uh, the collection, sorry, the collection of data, and identify what are the more sustainable patterns to put in action within the city. I'm not going through all the action areas that are um, uh, interested uh, in uh, in iChange because I have a short video that will give you uh, an overview of the project. But I, in, in this slide, you can see the three pillars that are the basis of the project. So meaning the empowerment through the knowledge with the data collection and the sensor and the uh, promotion of a science that is democratic, that it's open, that it's uh, um, accessible to citizens. The understanding of the role and the impact of individual cho uh, choices and collecting the behaviors. And finally, and last but not least, since as I said, is an interdisciplinary science uh, project, um, it's extremely important, has been, as, 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 as has already been said this morning, to identify data and indicators. So that's the reason why we are also working on in the environmental data app that will collect indicators and data that can be used, shared and collected together with citizens. This is a uh, short, uh, quick infographic that can give uh, uh, us uh, the complexity uh, of the project, where there are some actions that are evidence-based. Of course, the uh, presence of the university and research center guarantee the possibility to identify the scientific-based evidence, to, uh, uh, starting from experiences from the past project, but also um, implementing new living lab within iChanges. And then you can see the, all the actions and the activity, the co-design, the co-creation, the co-development, but also the, the citizen science approach, the concrete tools that we will develop, how they substantially um, uh, try to um, feed the living lab approach with developing novel scientific knowledge within the community and together with the community and foster personal and social behavioral change. And of course, the final target of the research is the uh, wider community in the living labs. So what are the main activities in iChange? And I think this uh, scheme can help us identify the two main pillars. One is the activation or reactivation of a 
uh, of eight living lab throughout um, Europe, but also in, in Africa, where citizens will be involved and, in, and participate to the collection data. They will be part of the research process. And throughout this research pr process, they will be able to increase their knowledge on climate change impact and to um, it, in, uh, be able to transform, to change their behavior towards a more sustainable lifestyle. And the second, but not the less important, it's the development on the Environmental Impact Hub, which is a multidisciplinary and that has a multidisciplinary and participatory approach, and it will be fed with all the data set of, of, of uh, the iChange project will provide, but also will be um, um, made as much as uh, interop interoperable with other data uh, centers and other data sets and um, with other um, computational infrastructure. So here is a short uh, video that I don't know if I might, if I'm able to, yes.
And that's all. Thank you. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Teresa, and that was a very nice video. Clearly, it, uh, yeah, there's a lot to, uh, to capture with the changing our, our behavior and, and the choices we make. So the next speaker, it's a pleasure to introduce uh, Marianne Zandersen. She's a senior researcher in environmental economics. Um, I met Marianne for the first time at the NBS workshop uh, in Brussels for coordinators of these projects right before the pandemic. And, and she actually said uh, in our working group, she said uh, something that has stuck with me and I've used it actually quite uh, a lot since. And what Marianne said is, we need more nature with a capital N. So please. Uh, an introduction to the ReGreen project, all capitals, Mayana. <laughs> Great. Thank you very much and thank you for inviting me. It's a pleasure to meet you again. <laughs> um, yes, um, ReGreen is, uh, is a project that is running for another 13 months. So we have results to share and lessons learned as well. But we're not the only project under that call. Um, there's another sister project called Clearing House, also working in China, and Interlace and Connexus working in together with uh, South America. Um, and we all under this call of international collaboration, cooperation, um, and urban restoration. So ReGreen has uh, three partners as urban living labs in uh, Europe. Aarhus, Vilika Goita in Aarhus in Denmark, Vilika Goita in Croatia, and Paris region here. Um, and from China, we've got research organizations representing Beijing, Ningbo, and Shanghai. And one lesson learned is that it's really, really good to have those living labs as real full partners in the project and not on a pro bono basis. Uh, it makes a, a lot of difference also in terms of the knowledge transfer from the cities. Um, to science and the other way. So ReGreen, um, 20 partners, six living labs, running until February 24, and we aim to integrate knowledge and evidence and benefits from NBS to look at urban challenges across the board um, and to develop and test tools to guide design and plan NBS. Um, and it's very important for us to take a systemic approach and to look at the quality of restoration activities. Um, and then, of course, also consolidate business and investment models. What, what is challenging, as we heard from earlier speakers as well. Um, but especially also to promote awareness and institutionalization through, for instance, experimental policy workshops um, and with education with school children or education across all ages. So you can see below the, the type of things that we focus on, children and youth experience, um, quantifying and modeling ecosystem services from NBS, uh, but the same thing, quantifying the benefits um, from NBS and their services, um, and improve the system of governance. Um, yeah. So I have a couple of slides. Um, I know this is, you're not supposed to read this matrix, but I have a QR code here and you can read more about it. But this is basically um, a matrix of the uh, NBS in urban setting looked at as, a, as an object like parks or linear features or blue infrastructure. And then um, uh, compared to the, the type of challenges and what level of impact they would have given the unit of implementation. So we look across the, the heat, flooding, water quality, air pollution, noise, but also in terms of uh, well-being and health, uh, stress reduction, um, and of course also on the level of biodiversity impact. So with this, this is based on, on literature evidence and from our own work, and we used a multivariate um, analysis to look at, well, um, some NBS in urban setting are more multifunctional than others. And the more multifunctional, the more they can cater for biodiversity. And that's actually a quite important lesson too. 
um, as also the NBS definition is to enhance biodiversity, and that's really there's a gradient in quality of NBS that's really important to to take um, into account. Um, another very important part of ReGreen is mapping and modeling of ecosystem services, and we've done that for the six uh, urban living labs. Um, we've done it in a comparable way um, from 2000 2020 and with scenarios uh, up to 2030 and there's a huge difference of course between the big cities in china where they have expanded by 80 percent over the last 20 years um, but at the same time they've also created a hundred square kilometer of green infrastructure so it's very paradoxical um, and we also have high resolution mapping that we use in these ecosystem service models. Um, and we also use it to, to link between biodiversity and education, like where are schools located, what's the road to the school, what learning opportunities are there. Uh, another um, work that is uh, under development, you can uh, find on this website here, uh, a film and explanation of it, but it's an interactive web-based tool for the urban living labs where we have this land cover. Um, and then as a planner, you can, for instance, implement a park where there is none today, and you can look at the multifunctional benefits of that, but also look at what people live around these areas. Um, Another piece of work that has already created quite an impact is actually from this region. Uh, it's, it's a deliverable that came out uh, last spring on depavement and renaturalization from the, our partner Institut Paris Région. Um, and so it's really looking at different uh, criteria um, in terms of climate, uh, biodiversity and, and human well-being and using remote sensing to look at the land cover the and then um, scoring the potential challenge or the level of challenge and then the potential for deep pavement but it doesn't stop there this um, uh, deliverable and work it also gives really good guidance on what do you do once you have deep paved an area and how to create high quality nature and they found out that in paris the uh, potential to deep pave and renaturalize is um, 1400 hectare. So that's in the Department, Department de Paris. Um, and that's really looking at the different challenges for biodiversity, adaptation, or improving health and living environment. And also looking at if you want to focus on one more than the other, there are different levels of, of, um, of potential. And so this methodology is actually being used now to create a tool by the Council of uh, the Region of Paris to assist um, local municipalities. There are a thousand municipalities in Paris region. And when they came up with this work, they were immediately advanced, approached by about 60 municipalities who wanted to know, how do we do this? Can you teach us? Tell us about it. So they were actually overwhelmed. So I think also with the nature restoration law, there's a huge need for these kind of uh, tools. Another thing that's quite interesting that also links to this, well, it's not virtual reality, but it's one way of, of getting into a different contact of your surroundings is walkable floor maps that are used for learning and for governance. So you can both have politicians, um, heads of departments, planners, as you can have um, teachers under education uh, or school children out there. So these are canvas auto photo of a whole municipality. The one to the right, is of Aarhus municipality it measures five by eight meters so it's really big you can walk on it and something happens really when you step into the map um, people start moving around um, talking first oh why live here where do you live and you start seeing some connections and what you can do with these maps you can add qr codes that link to nbs explanations or you can add uh, polygons on the map uh, saying these are flood risk areas or these areas we want to develop. So it's also a, a potential tool for co-creation and involvement of um, the public. And so we are still on the way, but we are developing guidance for how to work with this um, in different settings. 
Then also from here, from our partner of the museum, of Natural History Museum, they have uh, this vision that you call citizen science. Uh, so those are basically protocols of how teachers and uh, students can, can uh, observe and report on biodiversity that scientists at the museums uh, can then uh, start looking at how, <clears throat> what's the status of biodiversity. And through the Regreen project, this has been implemented in 14 schools, especially in deprived urban areas. And it's been translated into to English. And there's been a lot of work on implementing initiatives to schoolyards. So first observing what's the biodiversity at the outset, what birds do you see, and then implementing action and then observing again, how can you change that? Um, so it's a very nice um, uh, guidance here. Another thing we did in, in Regreen is an interactive, um, an educational learning platform called Greenopolis that's translated into English, French, Danish, and Croatian. And um, it, it looks at different themes of um, urban challenges, the diverse city, the sound of a city, the hot city, the, the wet city, the clean air in the city. So it's both teaching about nature-based solution, but it's especially taking kids outside the school ground. And so there's a lot of uh, exercises and background material for teachers to use. Um, so that's all finished. And a really exciting work from our partners in Sweden, um, SLU. They are working on what they call play biotopes. So how to create uh, a rich nature that induces playfulness uh, while respecting nature for kids to enhance movement uh, in urban settings. So they've done this in a laboratory, landscape laboratory in Alnab outside Malmö. Um, and they're actually demonstrating this in a new play biotope that's being implemented right now in the city of Örebro in Sweden. So we are underway with fact sheets and guidance of how to implement this. Um, um, I think most of our projects, we also want to bring out some information that people can readily read. So here are 13 best practice cases of uh, NBS that are not related to what Regreen does, uh, but within the, the theme of Regreen. Um, and that's also translated into Chinese language. And it, it really goes across the board from bio-rich meadows to green roofs to green noise barriers or butterfly conservation and job opportunities. So it really shows this, this huge uh, variety in what NBS is. And they really try to emphasize the good practices, the barriers and the lessons learned. Um, and it was also, um, interestingly, we, we linked it to the UN SDGs, which I think is, is really important that we keep that always in the midst of uh, NBS. We have eight podcasts created that um, talks about what is NBS and from the different ULLs and different um, themes, um, restoration of biodiversity in urban areas in Paris, how has that worked with in Velika Goritza, where they are in a complete different situation. They practically didn't know what was NBS before entering the project um, or um, water challenges of, and afforestation in Aarhus. Um, then we have a nature solutions platform where we, I think the interesting aspect here is that we open up for an online crowdfunding opportunity. So I invite you all to, to go visit it. Um, we have built it in a way of trying to find how would people ask questions to go through this and, and, and to provide easily understandable evidence on what does NBS do and what is it. So yes, you're most welcome to keep uh, following us or contact me and my colleagues. Uh, I can say that we have a Synodo community um, where we have this, um, our output and data and more will come up. And I have one last comment, if I may, I know I'm using too much time. It, it's about the legacy. Now we have got a bit more than a year left and uh, the commission has funded more than 400 million euros uh, for projects and each project is required to keep a website for five years. And of course, we've got Opla as the repository, Synodo, et cetera. But I was just wondering how we could be better at creating a legacy that makes it easier for people who want to know about it, be they investors or other cities who haven't been part of an EU project yet. How do they start with this? I know that from the, the 
yeah, a lot of stakeholders we talk to, they say, what is it? How do I start? And I think that's really, really important for mainstreaming. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mariana. It's a good question that we will uh, just put on hold and, and bring it up because I think the lessons learned exchange, especially with the uh, legacy and ups, uh, upscaling are quite important and relevant. So now we just uh, briefly move a little bit from land to the marine <laughs> context. Uh, Myron Pack is a biological oceanographer from the Royal Netherlands Institute for Sea Research. And I, I found another nice quote on your institute's uh, web page that, uh, that from you that gives us some hope, I think. It said, uh, it's not just gloom and doom in changing seas. So we look forward to hearing more about the marine context, the future Mares, please. Maya. Great, thank, thank you very much. Um, so this is the fifth uh, Death by PowerPoint presentation. So I'll try to go quickly and get through it, but thank you very much for the invitation. Um, switching gears a bit, this is really about networking and getting to know people. And that's why I wanted to be here in person to shake hands and talk to people about what they're doing in their projects and how we can uh, unite uh, our various um, products. So the Future Mari's product, uh, project is working on th two nature-based solutions, right? So effective restoration of coastal areas. So that's mostly habitat forming uh, plants and animals that I'll tell you about in a second. Uh, Nature-based solution two is effective conservation, which are marine protected areas, most of us think of that, but also about uh, conservation policy for marine turtles and other things. Um, and then the last one is, we've termed it sustainable harvesting or nature inclusive, inclusive harvesting. Now if you look uh, at, the, at the bottom, you see the services and cultural benefits, and we've talked about funding and how to get businesses um, involved in local communities, and so that list shows how these three, these two NBS and nature inclusive harvesting are linked together in the marine environment. And it's a very ambitious project, as most of these EU projects are. There are, within these three case studies, there are 40 storylines, not only within Europe, but also in Belize and in Chile. Um, so naturally, uh, I can't cover much of this today, and I'll give you some a couple results of a project that is now about two years old. We have two more years. We have a lot of opportunity to work together. Um, so a lot of partners, a lot of logos. Uh, you might find a logo that you know and love, and you know someone there, contact them but I'll give you the website information. So this is not work by me, this is work by a very dedicated group of, of, of scientists and working together across disciplines. So um, quickly, the one I think that most folks in the room would be interested in would be restoration of habitat forming species, right? Because these help reduce flood risk, they uh, clean the waters, um, they provide a lot of services, juvenile nursery habitats for fish and things, increasing biodiversity, and so this is really worth investing in. So if you're a company watching online, please invest in, in this. Um, we have one uh, that is on marshes. Most of it, um, we have one on uh, oysters that I'll show you, a couple on oysters um, and some seagrass habitats. But the nice thing about this type of, of NBS is that it also um, deals with blue carbon and starts to mitigate climate change. So you have a lot of benefits from, from that. So for the, an example for the oysters, um, if you look at the little map of the North Sea with a little orange area, in the past there were massive areas of oyster beds. And the question is, shall we restore those? And if we do, what happens to fisheries? What, what are the costs of, of doing that uh, to other sectors? Uh, what are the shifting baselines that we're dealing with in terms of what can we, what can we get back in the future? Now most of these, um, I would argue most of these restoration sites are going to be most successful if they're located within protected areas. And so um, that is one link between NBS2 and NBS1. Now these locations, uh, we, have, uh, we have a lot of marine protected areas located around Europe, and I'll show you a map in a second. Um, each one of these gives us the opportunity to work with local communities. Um, who live by the sea, um, 
And I think one of the challenges that we have that was mentioned before is scaling up um, to deal with MPAs and trash, trans, transnational uh, transboundary issues. Um, an example would be uh, an MPA uh, in the Carpanos and Sana um, island areas. Uh, a, again, a lot of different services, um, ecosystem services are brought from these coastal habitats, um, one of which was uh, dealing with um, um, habitat, um, uh, making sure the sediment is, is secure in habitats. Um, so again, uh, if we go, if we take a, a step further into nature inclusive harvesting, you might think, well, you know, this doesn't really interest me, but it, it should, because these things are all related to one another in terms of the productivity of habitats. Um, also in terms of financing, so I won't spend much, much time on this other than to highlight the fact that there are relationships and there are challenges right now in the North Sea where you have an energy transition, you have a nature transition, and you have a food transition. How are we going to do these at the same time and what is the role of nature-based solutions? Um, so that's been investigated um, in two of our storylines. Now again, um, I put up names of people and email addresses. You'll be able to see, uh, you'll get a copy of this, I'm sure, so you'll be able to figure out what these nine activities are, who's doing them. We talked about risk assessments. We've talked about climate change. A lot of, a lot of activities in, in future Mares, and I'll only show you quickly two of them um, now that we're two years in. One deals with how much, how much restoration how can restoration be successful? What have we lost? How are communities changing in the marine environment? The red areas on the map show the degree of warming over the last decades in certain areas of European seas. Um, the small graph that goes up that's really hard to read deals with a community temperature index and essentially the results are shown in the pie diagram. Essentially what we know is what we're documenting now that these systems are changing. They're changing into warmer water systems with warmer water species. And so we, when we store habitats, we have to think about that. What's gonna be successful? What species are gonna be successful in the future compared to what we had there in the past? And another second quick result, obviously, is that we need to understand the, the physical and biogeochemical changes of the environment. And we have spent quite some resources to downscale the latest estimates from the IPCC to figure out the different, in different time horizons shown in the, in the yellow um, bars, whether it's 2030 for a policy objective, 2050 or end of century that most academics like to talk about, uh, but companies aren't that interested in. Um, temperature shown uh, on your, I'm never very good at that, on your left, on your, yeah, on your left. And then the decrease in oxygen in, in, um, in uh, uh, bottom waters. The point I make here is that these are uncert there's uncertainty to these, and we've talked about this before, and we're trying to capture that and, and discuss that with, with uh, policymakers. Again, lots of activities in the program. I, I don't have time to go over all of them, but check out the website, get involved. Um, you can see how to do it in this slide. It's fairly straightforward. Um, and the other thing I'll say is that in our last meeting, um, we facilitated a, a one hour session between all of these projects that are either funded right now or coming up. And so there's just so much opportunity to work together uh, and we have to take advantage of it. It means a lot of time, some travel, uh, some more meetings, but it's really worth it in the end. So I thank you very much for the time uh, and I look forward to any questions and comments that you have. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, moving over now to the three uh, NBS for hydrometeorological risk reduction projects that are funded under the same call. So we refer to ourselves as the NBS Hydromet sister projects. Bjorn Kalsnes, he's a colleague, colleague of mine at the Norwegian Geotechnical Institute, but he has this core competencies as a real geotechnical engineer and he's working in the field of natural hazards and risk reduction. So he will share experience from the Physicus project. Sure. Thank you, colleague Amy. Um, so behalf on, on behalf of the NGI coordination team, I will say some words about uh, Physicus and the experience that we have made. Uh, main focus on that one. Um, 
We, as, uh, as Amy said, we are a part of we are three sister projects from the same coal, and it's, the coal was related to large-scale demonstrators on nature-based solutions for hydro meteorological risk reduction. So it's a bit different from the ones that have been before. So that's quite nice to say. Uh, I think we were the first uh, project to start. We started the 1st of May of 2018, all the three of them, Operandum, Refusicals and Reconnect. And we originally aimed for four years. Um, that we, well, we, we sensed quite early that that would be difficult, both due to the COVID pandemic situation, but especially since we're going to do a lot of, of implementation of solutions in the project. And uh, to be frank, four years is a, even for that sake, it's quite short. So we prolonged it with one year with uh, enthusiasm from the commission, I think. <laughs> um, in, in opposite to the other two projects, our sister projects, we focused on, on, the, on the mountains, uh, basically because perhaps they have not the same attention as, as uh, other, other areas also, but also it's in due, due to the, the type of risk that they are, they are facing in mountains with uh, large river basins. Uh, so it was basically a lot related to floods, uh, sediment transport, and, and the landslides in our, in our project. So it was perhaps in that sense, a bit limited type of hazard compared to, to the to other projects. Um, the core of, of the project, I would say, is, is the, the case sites. Uh, and in fact, a total of 50% uh, of the total budget was the direct cost for implementation of, of, the, of the demonstration, or the NBS. So that uh, really was the core, and we had, um, uh, so the other work that we had in, in this uh, project related to stakeholder involvement, to, to technical and, uh, and uh, framework uh, development, to policy issues, to training and to the demonstration was very much linked to that. So it was a two-way communication, two-way involvement, both that uh, these other uh, the tasks were giving information to the, to the case sites and the other way around. Um, I would mention perhaps that in our work packages uh, for the training, we developed uh, uh, virtual reality for, uh, for all these three demonstration sites and they are available today. That's the, the uh, advertisement and at the poster session in the in the in the lunch so you can go there to see what what we what we are presenting what we have developed for the virtual reality situation in the in the lunch um so we had in fact we had three uh, large demonstration uh, sites uh, one in uh, norway one in uh, italy and one in the pyrenees both on the french and spanish side uh, and we come back to those and then we have uh, two smaller case what we call the case site studies uh, which are more specific type of, of, uh, of uh, innovations or specific types of, um, of tests. Uh, one of them was the Isar River Basin, which was in fact a retrospective case because they were finished uh, with that and we, we used those experience that, we, that they had from, which was successful mainly in our project. And the other one is related to, to uh, retreating uh, glacier in the, in the Alps, Austrian Alps in Kaunertal, uh, where they've developed some kind of very innovative uh, solution of bacteria to, to, to revegetate or vegetate the area where we had this um, erosion problems from the retreating, retreating glacier. Um, what we did in our project, in, in total, we had 14 projects uh, developed uh, in, in um, in the, in the whole, and to select what kind of projects to, to go on with, they had quite a strict uh, selection criteria, uh, which has to pass uh, through the, the, the steering committee in the physicals. Uh, so all the projects from the three demo sites especially, uh, they had to uh, propose the proposal uh, and then see whether it uh, would succeed or not. And especially related to perhaps this kind of, let's say, greenwashing in some sense. I mean, was it nature-based solutions enough or was it not? Uh, so if we, in some cases, we, we didn't go on with that. But those were both the risk reduction related, but also to the old co-benefits that we have with nature-based solutions. Uh, for instance, really related to, to uh, environmental effects, to social effects, uh, and it's listed here uh, that you have uh, this kind of selections that we, well, all that they had to provide before uh, proposing a, um, a project. Um, 
to have a few words uh, the, the, about the, the different uh, projects that we have uh, in Gudbrandsdal in Norway, as you see, in the, which is in the uh, main valley between Oslo and Trondheim. Uh, they have experienced a lot of problems with the uh, floods and landslides in recent years. Uh, and perhaps by, uh, let's say, not intentionally, I think we, we ended up with, with a situation that in the Norwegian case, it was very much flood and uh, sediment transport related. In Italian case, which was in Tuscany, uh, it was uh, more on agriculture and some flood, while in the Pyrenees, it was very much landslide related. Uh, I don't think that was intention, but that's uh, how it ended, in fact. What's interesting in this case, I would say there's uh, some, some different var uh, various um, projects related to mainly floods and sediment transport. Um, the upper left there is, uh, I will come back to that one, because that was our first project that was almost uh, well clear, ready to start, I think, when FUSIC was started. But we had to cancel it because of different problems, which I will come back to. It's a uh, quite a big one, uh, receded barrier, which was both to to, uh, to better the flood situation and also to the biodiversity for and uh, for uh, in the area. Uh, in Italian case, it's not mountainous, as Amy said yesterday, because it's uh, it's in the Tuscany region, close to the, to the sea. So it's basically uh, agricultural type of of a problem. With uh, with pollution, with uh, erosion problem, uh, with runoff to the to the lake, uh, local lake, and they introduced these kind of buffer strips as the main uh, nature based solutions in the in the task. But there were also others. Um, I would mention this also because uh, related to stakeholder involvement, uh, because um, originally I think the farmers, which were the main stakeholders in this area. They were quite uh, restrictive to the to to the to the project, but when they were involved in a positive way, I think they really became positive to it, and uh, and uh, so they ended up very positive in that sense. So that's so to the involved stakeholder in various uh, I would say um, good ways are very important for that sake. The last. Um, the last uh, demo site is in the Pyrenees, as I said, both in the in the French and then the Spanish side. Uh, and if you know want to know more about the one in charge is sitting here, so he I think he will be very helpful to answer any problem uh, in in the break. Uh, those are uh, four of the projects are different projects are are and photos over here. Upper west left is vegetation for for snow avalanche, and then you have rockfall protection erosion protection and also debris flow so it's a variety of various uh, landslides uh, included in that in that project which is very interesting and it's some are finished and some are finishing these days um, back to the Norwegian case because um, uh, in our policy uh, development uh, of course also creating enablers is very or uh, is very important, but I would mention this one because this is the barriers that we experienced during this project uh, that was uh, stopped. Uh, and uh, there's a certain number of, of barriers that we identified, but perhaps three of them are very important in our case, I think. One of the things is that it was the general skepticism to, to nature solutions in the local, uh, local uh, area. Uh, and that, of course, includes lack of, of knowledge for sure. The other thing is um, funding, uh, funding and financial uh, situation because there's always some winning, there's some losing and some winning, and it's not only that. Uh, uh, so it's if we're talking about funding in in uh, for for nature based solutions, we have to to say perhaps have that in mind, even though it's cost effective and it's uh, perhaps someone loses, and who is losing? Uh, because you should address that, and that also was the situation here, I think. That would made it a problem. And the third one is related to the aerial uh, situation with the regulations also, because this was based, uh, partly private land, and that also caused uh, a problem, I would say. Um, some other lessons learned from, uh, from the implementation process, as I would say here. Uh, first, as we quite short, well, soon uh, in the project, early in the project we experienced, that things take time. Uh, and that's 
both in the whole process, it's in the planning process, and it's not the least related to the public procurement. Uh, and that's partly also why it stopped in the, in the innovation case. I think it's, that's the same situation all over Europe, even though in Norway it may be special <laughs> to say it. And the other part here I would say is uh, the stakeholder involvement, which is very important our part, and it's also to address specific stakeholders, both those are perhaps can uh, act as ambassadors for the project, but also those that are perhaps uh, maybe problematic in the, in the event. So involve them early, uh, I, I think it's quite uh, quite early, quite important. And the third point that's given here is uh, related to the public land that I addressed in the previous um, um, mail um, file. What one thing to be uh, aware of, I think, that is taking time to establish especially if you are using vegetation that we uh, in many cases do for uh, for our in our project of course it's not effective from day one so to have that in mind i think that is quite important uh, for for research projects as well as as other projects the final um, final um, uh, slide here is uh, okay we have four months yet for physicals uh, but we have some some statements we can share, can't we, Amy? What do you think? We can. Um, one thing is to integrate uh, NBS into the planning processes, and I said get guidelines, uh, laws, collaboration, and we may question, or at least I may question, uh, how strict should this uh, planning process be? Should there only be guidelines? Should, we, should it be some kind of a law? Because are guidelines effective enough? I question that, to be frank. Uh, that perhaps we would, we need to be much more tougher to 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 stimulate uh, this kind of uh, of, pro of uh, products. What's what's also quite interesting, I think, it has uh, traditional uh, techniques that were used for hundred years back. They are revitalized now in our projects, uh, and I think that was very quite quite fun to see. Uh, which also created problems in appearance specialists because they don't have this kind of specialities to 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 handle to handle this. Um, and this may perhaps be especially for, for uh, mountain areas where perhaps maybe very remote, where it's difficult to come up with machinery, these kind of things. So it's, uh, and you can see it other places also that uh, these kind of traditional techniques going being popular and can be used in small scale. Uh, and then the third uh, part I would say is of course that the monitoring is, uh, and that's a uh, problem that we face in physicals and I suppose in the other ones also because we don't have enough time to to monitor uh, in a, in a fire project so because they're just finished uh, implemented and of course another thing is that uh, is special for this uh, hydrometric goals risk project is uh, we are designing for extreme situations I mean extreme rainfall extreme uh, uh, land fire, landslide situation and of course to monitor how these nature solutions are doing in a situation which is not extreme is perhaps well to find a situation where it's extreme is quite difficult for uh, for uh, that so we have to model of course in that sense and also what we do to need to do in this kind of project is to to organize some kind of a post project collaboration and we're trying to do that in physicals even though we are we are ending in in may we will continue with uh, with uh, with uh, monitoring that uh, uh, that uh, in the different uh, projects because that's also very important um, my last comment and that's my very last is related to the, the never-ending discussion about what is nature based solutions um, I would say that in in uh, in physicals hybrid solutions have been welcome but of course there's always a risk for greenwashing and uh, and uh, we should be very aware of that because uh, it seems like uh, nature based solutions is becoming more or less the same as uh, suit, uh, uh, sustainability, which is more or less a concept which is in my ears are more or less dead because it's like covering everything. So we should really risk, uh, be af well, afraid of that one. That's my last moral <laughs> comments. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Bjorn. <laughs> It's good you end with uh, something philosophical. <laughs> good. And now we move to, to Claire Warmenball. She has been presented earlier as a communications professional mm. from IUCN. 
And IUCN is a, is a, um, a key partner in the, the ReConnect project. So in this roundtable panel, she will be sharing details about the ReConnect project, another one of the NBS HydroMet sister projects. Claire. Thank you. Thank you very much, Amy. I need to specify here that I'm uh, stepping in for uh, Zoran Vojinovic, who is the uh, project coordinator of the reconnect project um, and he couldn't attend due to family issues he would have explained it much better than me but i will i will do my best i have to also say thank you amy um, and silvana because um, actually one of the key questions here on this round table is about implementation challenges and uh, obviously we we've had um, the COVID pandemic for the past two years and with uh, Amy and Silvana, so basically the operandum and um, I have a mind gap. Operandum and Physicus project. We organized a um, uh, a session at World Water Week in uh, Stockholm, but it was completely virtual. So we actually have never even met in real life. So it's a it's a real pleasure, and I think maybe that goes for more people here who who actually meet each other uh, in real life for the first time. And earlier we had the comment about death by PowerPoint, so I'm not going to um, bore you, but also we've had death by Zoom meetings in the past two years. So maybe this is a, a hybrid and I, I, uh, I say hello to the people who are online, um, the audience online, if there's questions, don't hesitate, you're very much part of this round table. And maybe that is the way to go forward. Uh, just as much as MBS can be a hybrid approach. So I will tell a little bit more about the ReConnect project. Um, okay, I don't know if there's a way to go back. Yes, here we are. Okay, so my role in uh, ReConnect is through IUCN and IUCN works together with uh, GSIC which is an Italian research organization and we look after the communications and dissemination of uh, ReConnect. You can see what ReConnect stands for on the slide, Ecosystems Regeneration and Nature-Based Solutions to Reduce Hydrometeorological Risk. So for our project, it's particularly in uh, rural and natural areas, um, whereas Physicus is more in mountainous areas. So these are sister projects uh, because we actually all work together also and share uh, each other's knowledge uh, in our different landscapes, which I th personally think is fantastic that uh, it is set up as such. IUCN came in only halfway through the ReConnect project and we were really impressed with all the activities uh, that had taken place so far. So basically it's a five year EU project. Um, just looking at my notes, but it, it says there as well, six years, oh yes, it, it's been extended. Um, and the coordinator is uh, through IHE in Delft. Um, and we have over 36 partners. Now with ReConnect, what's really interesting is that we have both collaborators and demonstrators, which is great because that means that there is the implementation of project projects in the field, and that goes through the demonstrators, and the collaborators is the research scientists, so the people doing actually the data collection, the metrics, and these two groups work together, which is fantastic. And us in communications and dissemination obviously get to benefit because we have stories from the field, but we also have data and evidence to use in the stories and um, communicate the impact of the work. Basically, we are looking at a holistic approach um, and that goes through um, different ways that you can see here on the slide, but we've, we've talked quite a bit about different approaches um, and I just would like to sketch the project a little bit more first. Um, you can see, so there's, there's a network of uh, demonstrators in the different uh, sites in Europe, but we also go beyond Europe worldwide. Uh, Colombia, Australia, Malaysia, who are doing research work. 
And when we have our biannual uh, assembly meetings, which have been mostly online, it's been fascinating to hear from all the different uh, projects uh, in, the, in the world on how they have implemented MBS and the different obstacles that they have overcome, because it's obviously not only implementation, there's legislation, there's financial, and I, I find it also fascinating, the first uh, presentation uh, by Tag on, on, on the psychological, like how do we, how do you get people um, involved in, in the buy -in, uh, and the buy-in and therefore also communicating on, on what are the mental health benefits of these uh, projects. Um, so we work in, in various uh, river basins. Um, I will not go through each one of them but I will go a bit more specifically into two of them. Um, here, this uh, Isle River Basin, Room for the River, I mentioned it a little bit earlier in my uh, presentation. It's, um, it's been a very interesting project for us because obviously we had uh, the flooding in Europe uh, a couple of years ago, which was dramatic in some countries and slightly less dramatic in, in others where, and this was also mentioned by another panelist this morning, they had a very good early warning system in place in the Netherlands. And so there had been a good financial investment backed by strong policy implementation um, to allow for this early warning system to support all the other mes measures of MBS that they had put in place. So this was something that during that year at our General Assembly was really uh, explored and then uh, you plant seeds within the other river basins and in research projects to then um, share ideas on how this can work in, in other uh, river basins as well. Now I will say a little bit more about uh, the two river basin in Switzerland where we had our last um, meeting which was live and, and uh, in place. Um, in the Tour River Basin, it was a very interesting um, place as well for nature-based solutions because not only is the Tour River was uh, very prone to flooding, um, and the interesting part there was that there was a very strong local support, not just locally from people who are willing to see their taxpayers' money go into NBS approaches, but also legal, uh, from a legal point of view, um, Switzerland had put in place in 2011 a law which um, actually obliges cantons, as they are called in Switzerland, to um, uh, restore riverine ecosystems as a legal obligation. And this law has really helped local communities to actually gather the necessary funds and uh, not just for the implementation of it but also for the public uh, awareness campaigns to support uh, riverine uh, restoration and we were lucky enough to go visit one of the sites which is also always part of these uh, general assemblies which really brings together people who are actually working on the project in the site as well they how they showed us how the river was restored, the forest was replanted, there was space for um, flooding into the floodplains, not just to be absorbed by those floodplains, but also to recharge uh, groundwater and therefore improve the quality of the groundwater. So with all, with all this, um, and, and to maybe look a little bit more at the, uh, the, the question, I think I am I'm very glad that we can meet uh, in, in place again and that the hybrid solutions are there in order for us to continue implementing the work. It's a huge honor and a pleasure to hear all the other fantastic projects that are being presented here. And I look forward to, uh, to um, more sharing and as Marianne mentioned as well, to also really hone in on how, how can we work together in order to create this legacy of all these solutions and, and, and the impact that has created and, uh, and generate more momentum on, on those ama that amazing work that has taken place. So with that, I will give it back to Amy. Thank you very much. Thank you, Claire. Nice. And uh, before we open up for questions, <clears throat> Last but not least, we have Laura Sandro Leo. She is a senior assistant professor at the University of Bologna 
and actively involved in the Operandum's GOIKP web platform. But I think as such, you're really quite central in the Operandum project, so you have a very good overview over all of the different activities and not in the least this very interdisciplinary approach among the Operandum partners and all of the stakeholders that have their entry point into the web platform. So we very much look forward to this last presentation, also because Operandum is the first of the three sister projects to finish. So they're really ready to roll out their, say, recommendations and main conclusions. So please, Laura. Yeah, thank you. And uh, hello, everybody. So yes, I'm here representing, representing Operandum project that is uh, uh, as the name says, stand for Open Air Laboratories for MBS to manage hydro meteor risk. And uh, this uh, is a project reaching an end, as uh, it was just said. And the main aim, as you can see in this slide, was really to test and co-develop and demonstrate different type of natural based solution in uh, uh, several uh, European uh, territories, but also non-EU. EU. And uh, to do this, uh, uh, considering different uh, climate uh, uh, conditions, different uh, cultural and social as asset, uh, and different uh, ecosystem. And uh, 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 last but not least, uh, different type uh, of hydromet hazard. Now, uh, in, in the next session, there will be actually the coordinator of this project, Silvani Salvatino, that uh, is going to present in detail uh, this uh, result. So I'm, I'm going to, let's say, talk about uh, Operandum, as uh, uh, you mentioned, from uh, a specific uh, point of view, which is uh, the platform developed inside the project. Uh, we are reaching an end, and uh, indeed, we ask ourselves how we can make sure that all the new MBS technologies, uh, new scientific, no scientific knowledge, and methodologies developed in Operandum can be conveyed uh, to the large community. And how can Operandum can inspire uh, the uptake and replication of a natural based solution? So, this is uh, uh, why uh, we put so much effort in this platform called JoIKP. So uh, my idea is to first show you this video that uh, gives you an overview of what GeoIKP is about. And uh, if you can uh, please, yeah. Sometimes nature interferes with our lives in dangerous ways, especially in recent years when climate change has been increasing the magnitude and frequency of the hazards we are facing. What can we do to reduce these risks without a further impact on the environment? Our Geospatial Information Knowledge Platform, or GeoIKP, answers this question. Our approach is based on using nature to develop protective mechanisms that help tackle climate change. We can do this either by applying natural preventive design themselves, or modifying them in a sustainable way with biodegradable tools to work with nature. These are the so-called nature-based solutions, or NBS. In our platform, we provide a wide range of information about NBS. Our focus is set on climate and water-related hazards such as droughts, landslides, floods, or coastal erosion. We are ready for all kinds of visitors. If you are a citizen or local community, GLIKP will introduce you to the basics of NBS. You can check the ones implemented in your area or read about how NBS are protecting other communities. If you are a policymaker, you can check all the legal details of nature-based solution in the policy catalog or use our interactive toolkit to discover opportunities for implementing them. If you have a business profile, GeoIKP also includes a networking tool where you can find other stakeholders and funding opportunities and even promote your own company. And for those looking for research data sets, we offer an extensive collection in our open access database. You can either download them or use our interactive web GIS tool to analyze them and create downloadable maps in real time. All data is constantly updated thanks to external contributors and thanks to the work of our open air laboratories, living labs distributed around the world where scientists test and develop nature-based solutions. 
Check out our platform if you want to know more about MBS or share your knowledge with a specialized and dynamic community. Join the conversation in www.gofikp.operandum-project.eu. Okay, so I hope uh, this uh, show what is uh, our uh, main goal with this platform. So this uh, slide uh, uh, can um, summarize a little bit all the different repositories and uh, uh, tools that are inside uh, uh, JOAKP. And uh, why is that? Because we really try to cover uh, all the different thematic area and, uh, related to the MBS topic, like in Operandum. So you find a repository for policy, a repository for MB, MBS case study, and so on. And uh, as was mentioned in the video, the idea was that also external user can really contribute to the platform, not only uh, you know, uploading or sharing new MBS project, but also sharing, for example, new policy document or new data set, and even uh, the, uh, the story of their community in implementing an MBS uh, project. So uh, going back to the original question, how all this tool uh, can uh, support, uh, let's say, and inspire other people to uh, implement uh, MBS in their own territories. So the first step, of course, will be really uh, for the platform to uh, guide the user uh, to get familiar with this concept. So learn what an MVS is, uh, what are the benefits, what type of MVS are, av are available. Or even learn uh, again from others community by uh, another tool called Citizen Stories that I was mentioning before. Then, of course, uh, what as a user I will ask uh, to myself is, okay, so uh, what MBS should I use for my problem on, or for my area? And that is why we have, of course, the MBS catalog with uh, more than 500 case study where one can check for a similar example dealing with the same problem or that already exists in their own territory or uh, 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 vice versa, going to, going to the MBS toolkit where uh, they can draw an area on the map and uh, select the hazard and see what recommendation in terms of MBS uh, are available. And uh, of course, at this point, this is just, uh, you know, to be a, a sort of uh, um, guidance for the user, which at this point, has to really get in touch with actual MBS expert and partner to make sure that uh, the intervention is fit for the purpose. And that's why we, we also have this uh, MBS networking tool where uh, you can find uh, uh, several uh, institutions and funding mechanism for MBS. So you can see here how it works, you have a list uh, of different uh, um, registered partner and uh, you can see what type of MBS that you have already implemented. And then of course uh, one needs to, uh, to consider all the different regulation and permission that uh, uh, an MBS project take. So we offer in that sense uh, two tools to get the user. One is uh, the policy legislation database, so you can check uh, in your own country uh, what are uh, the, the, uh, the different uh, legislation related to MBS so can, uh, can support the project, and uh, also the permitting path, which is more a uh, step-by-step -step guidance with example from uh, different country in Europe taken from our living lab. And then when we go to implementation, there are other tools available like uh, a co-creation pathway with uh, the different sta stage uh, described and uh, uh, connected to story maps that show exa example of uh, best practices. And the uh, last uh, tool that I would like to mention is also the interactive uh, map 
where uh, basically you can upload uh, either from your computer or using uh, the already available data set in our uh, portal to uh, analyze the area that you are interested uh, in. So, uh, for example, combining uh, a land cover information with uh, uh, adult maps and so on. So, one was uh, what was one of the main challenges in uh, developing this uh, platform? The fact that we really want to try to reach a wide uh, community, so different type of users. Uh, uh, category as was mentioned also before means that you really need to address and fulfill so different type of uh, expectation and needs and uh, it, it is not, not easy to make uh, to maintain uh, a platform that is rich but at the same time uh, user friendly is easy to navigate and so on so i think at the end uh, we were able uh, uh, to uh, let's say convert this challenge in a strength because what we did was basically customize the platform for the different user profile and i think that jqp in this sense is one on its own let's say uh, in terms of available mbs platform and this you will realize just when you land on the platform the first action that you will be asked to do is really to select who you are so what type of profile you belong to and based on the choice that you made you will land on a different phase of the platform itself so for citizen it will be more guided and with basic information and while for other user profile, it will tailor a different user journey depending on what are your needs again. And so you can see how here we switch from one profile and another. The second challenge that I want to mention is that trying to cover all the different aspects of MBS, of MBS means also uh, we, uh, being able to really ingest uh, a lot of different type of data set for, from a lot of different uh, uh, data sources and uh, uh, so uh, again this was challenge and the way we approached that uh, was by developing uh, a, uh, an advanced uh, data model where all the different uh, thematic area or MBS are connected together and why this is important from the user perspective because at the end we were able to provide the user with uh, an easy way to search and filter results to compare uh, different uh, case study and to really integrate all the different components of the plat platform together and again to easily ingest external data coming from the user themselves so I will finish showing you this example that uh, give in practice uh, um, an idea of how this works. So starting from the MBS catalog, you can see that you can search case study by keyword or by hazard and so on. No? And then you can make a comparison between them. So each case study you select, not only you can go through and have uh, let's say the detail, but also see what are the related MBS with similar characteristic or addressing a similar hazard, related policy, and if available, also related data set. And then you can take two or more case study and compare them together easily, just uh, you know, looking at the different uh, field, like uh, type of ecosystem, type of intervention, and so on. And the same feature are applied in other component, like this one that is uh, the policy catalog, where not only you can read and download the policy itself, but you can see which case study were actually related to this specific uh, uh, policy. And then uh, I stop here. Uh, I really need to thank you, Caio team, that together with uh, Unibo, uh, made this big effort possible and I'll uh, thank you very much for the attention.
Thank you very much, uh, Laura. Well, okay, now we open up for, for questions. I believe there are some that have been uh, come on the chat, and so maybe Irena can filter those. If anyone in the audience has a question, I invite you to walk up closer to the microphone here, and we'll take those after a while. But before we start, I think we go back to what Mariana asked us in the middle. How can we be better with the legacy? And I, my first thought that came to my head as, as we were discussing here, I think um, what we know now, when we first were, were funded as a project, this idea of clustering came as part of the negotiations with the contract with the EU. It wasn't explicitly written in the, the call, but now this is included in, in the call. And I think that really helps actually build the legacy because we have these platforms for uh, exchanging ideas and collaborating together. But I think we still have this, how do we really activate it? So I open it up to our, 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 yeah, our panel here. Do any of you have any good recommendations on how we can be better at ensuring legacy? Darko. Yeah, it's working. Yeah. <laughs> Basically, I came uh, not from the horizon world, but I came from the interact world. Uh, this means that in my past uh, 20 years of the career, I have implemented about 70 interact projects. Um, yeah, sorry, what is it? <laughs> um, I have implemented just five or six horizons, but uh, there is a big difference between both worlds, and I believe that if you if you would connect uh, the logic of uh, both programs, we might could come to solution about legacy and impact. Uh, I'm referring particularly on the Interreg Europe program. Interreg Europe program basically has the website. On that website, you can. Um, check in the good practices but these good practices are then once again checked by the experts and only if they pass this test they are written as a good practices what interact europe is doing the next step it is basically trying to connect the policy makers through different projects um, and the idea in which we could, um, you know, support the projects uh, on the long term and actually get some um, legacy and, uh, and uptake would be maybe to create a program which would combine the horizon with uh, the activities where on one side there would be all the best practices available but not just this, the program should also finance the travel costs of the policy makers, decision makers to see these good practices. Because usually if the policy makers see them, then there's a quite good chance that they would implement them. So if some of the funders or some who has some, something to say uh, regarding the next calls is listening to this, I would suggest that this that Horizon program would have like a continuation program where basically uh, we would need from each EU member state at least one partner who would then coordinate on the one side the policymakers who would go to the study visits to the other countries and also organize the study visits for the foreign policymakers. This would be my idea. Does it work automatically? Yeah, thank you very much. Um, I was in a, a, a project as the coordinator of series, another EU project, and it uh, we had a sister project, and and now that I'm doing future mares and act now coming up, and there's we do need a we need some kind of mechanism that brings projects together after they're done, um, that's funded, that can bring all the tools together. We're all, and the other, the other point I wanted to make is that Biodiversa is a, the Biodiversa program, uh, maybe five, six years ago, they, they gave some instructions to, um, to PIs. And one of those was, you know, how do you work with stakeholders? And it was a best practice guide. And it was very useful. 
and very informative, and that must have come from some suggestions from scientists or social scientists or whatever, and it really restructured how these projects are, uh, in some cases, how these projects are done, and certainly I think we all have the same lessons learned in many of these projects where we try to speak the right language to the right people. Um, we maybe bite off a bit more we can, than we can chew with our funding. Um, we want to continue monitoring. Um, that was this, I, I, could, I could list the same things that you listed in a project that's completely different. I was working on fish and climate change, but most of my recommendations were very similar to yours you know, in terms of what we should do in the future. So somehow we, we need a mechanism to bring these things together and to design the future cause. And, and it's frustrating that um, we only have four years in many of these projects to, to try to accomplish that. So uh, I don't know if that makes sense, but um, anyway, some of my thoughts on, on what we heard. Thanks. Nice suggestions. Yes, Tag. Yeah. Um, Thanks so much for the interesting ideas, and I don't have the same experience, but I've uh, received a lot of support from our project officer and our clustered project, so I guess we're all trying to learn fast. And I think one way to accelerate the learning is perhaps, and it was mentioned at a Biodiversa Plus meeting recently with NBS projects, is to fund research which synthesizes the research findings. Um, and in some ways, okay, we don't need more research, but we need research that looks at beyond just the findings, but more about uh, the implementation, uh, the upscaling and the replication, and also the financing. So I, I think there is, it, it's often done in within the German research ecosystem that they do meta-synthesis. So you look at what are the findings across many different projects. And certainly from a health perspective, which is the, the sector I come from, I think that would be really invaluable um, because we could connect with a health cluster with our own um, cluster for NBS and health projects. And this could be uh, ha helping set the scene for future work so that we can accelerate the learning because these opportunities are invaluable, but perhaps a, a specifically funded call could help accelerate us on that pathway. Thank you. Nice, very nice reflections. I think now just to open it up a little to the chat, uh, Irena, perhaps uh, there's some nice questions there to either one individual uh, uh, panelist or to the group, please. So thank you for a great discussion, I'm really delighted and I'm not alone, there are around, well, still a big crowd of people attending online, there are a few generic questions, so of course we will share all the presentations uh, in the due time. I might pick one interesting and well open to all the panelists about NBS efficacy. So what do you think? How should we evaluate NBS efficacy? Should it be through indicators related to social or physical aspects or through cost effectiveness? So any insights, ideas on that? Maybe and the as efficacy indicators. A quick re repeat of the question: Was it what they thought about the indicators, or so what? Um, well, I'm, I'm a, a bit. I rephrased a bit the, the the question. But how do you evaluate the efficacy of NBS? Is it social indicators that really matters and where, give a weight to NBS, or um, are we focusing of cost effectiveness, for example? Yeah, or all together or yeah. well, the efficacy of the NBS, how effective they are, and yeah, how do you evaluate if you've succeeded, the, which indicator maybe do, would you weight the most? And yeah, I think if, if I interpret that, or all of them together. I could say some words Bjorn, in, yeah, to, in, start, in, to start, start with off, only. Yeah. Uh, but in physicals, we made a framework, and I think Carlo is here, who is in charge of that, uh, that involving all of them, yeah, he's sitting back here is in all these kind of aspects. So there's some kind of waiting procedure to come up with that. Uh, uh, but having said that, I think um, uh, you have to prioritize in some way. I mean, I, I am, I'm not that sure that, you know, the definition of nature-based solution according to the European Commission that it is cost-effective. 
uh, okay, if it's not cost effective, it's not nature based solution then. So I'm not sure if uh, yeah, I agree with that then. So it's like, uh, what is most important uh, for sure. But as I said, the framework in physicals, that goes for all, the, all this uh, type of indicators. Yeah, in Go Green Roots, um, we actually conducted a health impact assessment already, and we're just over halfway through. So we demonstrated that if you meet the WHO recommendation for access to green space, essentially a football pitch within five minutes walk of your residence, um, if we had that across European cities, we analyzed a thousand of them, you would save 43,000 lives, and there'll be a cost benefit analysis to be done later in the project. And it's a matter of prioritization. So in the short term, you can actually look at some health benefits. In the long term, you might be looking at ecological and ecosystem benefits. And because in the short term, it's interesting to know there are trade-offs and disservices sometimes for biodiversity. And that's the nature of the temporal challenges you have in NBS projects. But suffice to say, I think it's really important that we focus on a range of indicators across different timescales. Um, in ReGreen, we work a lot about what, what is the quality of NBS, and it's actually a gradient. So it really depends on what is the objective that you want to obtain. And oftentimes, these, if you change the NBS um, to, to change the management of it um, towards more biodiversity, you could obtain the same impact, but get some added benefits to it. So there are some kind of um, free rider things you can do on an NBS, but I think what is important in evaluation is that you also start out by having a quality criteria, because if we take the case of green roofs, if we uh, think about an industrial standard, it would be the sedum moss. It's uh, quite uh, with a lot of plastic and, or you could have a, a different type of more with more substrate for instance and, and obtain a lot more services so if if we always go for the minimum value and then assess it for water retainment it's all fine if that's sufficient but is that what we want to live with so i think these indicators we have to have something behind about what is the philosophy behind the nbs and we have to reach a high quality level um, for our own sake I completely agree. Let's see. Um, I go. Yeah, Claire, please. Um, yeah, I just just wanted to add on to um, to what was said, and then this question. I found um, what was uh, for us with reconnect. We had, for example, so you, the the benefit of MBS in this project is very much focused on the benefit of reducing risk, right, from a hydrometeorological, so water-related climate risk. But what you can discover, what uh, in our project, it was in Colombia, the uh, co-benefit turned out to be that when uh, the MBS implementation was done, the sites around where the water was captured uh, turned out to be much safer. And as a result, more families flocked to those areas and real estate property went up. So there was an increasing value of housing that was a co-benefit that people, the, the early adopters benefited from. So there's multiple ways in which co-benefits can evolve from the implementation down the line that in the beginning you might not have necessarily included, but do become part and parcel of the overall um, uh, of the overall result towards uh, the end and ongoing. So I just wanted to, add, I thought that was a nice example when uh, our colleagues from Colombia shared that story with us. Any more comments about uh, indicators and uh, maybe please, Teresa, we take this and then if anyone uh, from the audience has a question, please come forward. Uh, so. But oh, Teresa first. Yeah, as already said, the project that I'm presenting here is quite new, but um, we also given the experience of Operandum and the necessity to keep all these indicators together because you need to measure the efficacy of MBSs, but also 
the, the impact and the efficacy of the stakeholder engagement, how they feel responsible for the project, how the knowledge arise, uh, arise and everything. The um, iChange project, uh, some sp a specific task on the socio-economic assessment and evaluation within the, the project in itself. So um, we're not focusing only on NBSs, but NBSs are part of some living lab experience as for Bologna, for example, also because uh, um, we are dealing with air pollution uh, challenges, so NBS is, seem to be appropriate to face these challenges, but the project itself has tasks related to um, socioeconomic uh, evaluation, so we are um, developing together with more let's say classical uh, or related to NBS's uh, indicator, also social and economic uh, indicators. And this is uh, why the composition, for example, of the UNIBO uh, team is composed by the Department of Physics, but the Department of Sociology and the, the Department of Economics to keep together and to replicate or try to replicate the complexity of the NBS project and implementation and in facing challenges uh, related to climate change. One, one quick follow-up. Um, I didn't have time to go through a lot of the activities. We do social ecological risk assessments and social economic, um, we use social economic indicators. The, the point I wanted to make is that NBS in marine systems like habitat restoration, they take a long time, really before you see the benefits. And then upscaling them, that's gonna really require that the local communities and the region and the region understand what's happening and the local communities are, in some cases, actually doing the science um, with folks. Um, so that's lessons learned from outside of Europe, but that can also come and work well in Europe. So I think the local community has to be involved for these things to be uh, successful. And therefore the indicators you use um, have to, have to have to reflect that. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, good point, nice. Uh, we have a question from the floor, uh, was it? Please. Yeah, no, th yeah, thank you very much. No, maybe I would like to, to come back just a minute to the previous point. I think it's quite important to see that a lot of questions come around the what after. And I will not surprise you in saying that in attending many different conferences on many different topics, the what after the project is always very up in, uh, in the list of questions and in the agenda. I think the slide from Bjorn, the last slide was very interesting about the post project uh, element. So you call it legacy. I'm even, and it's maybe a first question, uh, wondering if we shouldn't be more ambitious, talking about mainstreaming, talking about replication, even more than a legacy. And I would just put my, my two cents before really opening, maybe again, if we have time, the question to you for how to, these are very wonderful projects and it's so amazing to see what we can do, but it's really driven. It has a governance body, it has so many things around it, experts, etc. but what is also important is to see how we can do things after it when we don't have the governance entities, etc. So, my, my two cents before opening uh, again maybe this question is first of all and maybe it's it's aligned with what the over panelists said why don't we embed specific budgets in the project itself for the follow-up actions for really working on the replication working on the mainstreaming of these successful results outside the scope of the project so that's might be also something to explore. Also, of course, with the donors, with the commission, which is a huge actor in, uh, in this system. Uh, the second one, which was already uh, partly uh, uh, addressed by the, the last uh, element is this kind of extremely important communication portals. So this uh, GOIKP uh, is, I think, important. And my point would be, uh, maybe we can try to link this time-bounded project with longer-term uh, initiatives where we can feature this. So today I'm saying, why don't we talk about, for example, 
uh, making this portal uh, featured and available in the toolbox made by the Making Cities Resilient initiative for all local authorities to have access to it and to uh, dive into it and then to, to close a kind of, uh, of a loop. So again, it's, it's an open debate, but really uh, thank you very much for sharing these nice examples and I think we will all try to, to, uh, to continue to, uh, to have a catalytic effect in, in sharing it as much as possible. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for the, that reflection and uh, I could maybe try to reformulate the, I hear the question a bit because I, I like that uh, as researchers maybe we shouldn't be so much concerned about legacy and let go some of the ownership of our projects and really le let it kind of go over into the, the mainstreaming and the upscaling. So if we take a little bit of this so the last five minutes before we close the session to to talk about um, maybe some recommendations for how we can move toward uh, toward the upscaling, uh, particularly the, the projects that have been going for a while. What do you know now that you wish you would have known at the beginning of the project so that it could support this mainstreaming and upscaling of, of NBS? Anyone would like to, to offer some first thoughts about that? I guess um, one way of looking at it, and it's not a direct answer to the question, is how can we leave cities with the drive, initiative, and skills to replicate and upscale themselves? In Go Green Roots, we've developed toolkits, which as a researcher aren't you know, your primary goal, but the toolkits are designed to be embedded in platforms by the cities so they can measure health, they can measure ecosystem resilience, that they have a way of looking at future potential for NBS. So in that case, we're handing the power or empowering the cities and the citizens to do that. And I think it's a different question and much harder to answer is how the, the discrete projects might work in a more holistic way in the future. Thanks. No, uh, probably one point uh, that is, uh, you know, connected to the original discussion on legacy and synergies is that going, uh, if one could go back at the project level, probably uh, some, uh, you know, uh, good effort in trying to make sure, uh, even with the community, that uh, we can assure a long-term monitoring of the solution some mechanism that you can put in place with, from the very beginning as part of the co-creation process so that uh, you know the efficacy of the MVS can be really validated on the long term the efficacy which also embed the co-benefit we were discussing about so this is definitely uh, my point of view and uh, in terms of what you just said, you know, to have a toolkit and other tools available at local level, then from a, from a operandum perspectives uh, with the platform, I will say that uh, it means really a big effort also in co-creation in, in this perspective. And I mean, we were not lucky with COVID. So the consultation with uh, external user, they need was very, you know, frustrating. <laughs> but still, uh, each own uh, community or user profile uh, will have uh, its own need. So it's a big effort, and, but it's a good ambition, ambition try to customize, uh, you know, a tool or a platform to a specific need which is, could be the one of the municipality. Yes, I really like this idea. Okay, thank you, Laura. Bjorn, please. Yeah, uh, uh, this does not function, but this one. Sorry about that. Um, one reflection I have done uh, during the last period of the physical project is that, uh, and I'm talking on behalf of the hydrometeorological risk situation, uh, I think it's different for other types of NBS situations. But basically is that uh, upscaling in our view 
in our types of hazards is basically perhaps not that much that they are much bigger. We have much many more. We have a small, instead of one big dam, we make hundred different small uh, solutions into that upstream. Or that. So, it's the, so upscaling is that you have this kind of system more than you have these big uh, mechanical uh, uh, solutions. I have a strange comment to make. Uh, I guess we're recorded. Um, so the, you know, and when we write these projects, if we're successful with them, we, we sort of know the elements we need to put in, and we know that sometimes we don't have enough money to do a great job. So one would be uh, 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 ocean literacy. So a project like Future Mares is focused really on the science-based advice, and ocean literacy and reaching out to the public is not something we're doing and we never really were designed to do that. But there are very good groups, and I've seen some examples today that, that reach out for ocean literacy or literacy in general and educating young people. And if, if there could be projects funded, because I, I truly believe that if you educate the young, ne the next generation, and you give them the information from these projects, that that's how you affect change because society will demand that we use nature-based solutions and then uh, then then you then you'll see a transformation and so i think something like a mechanism like that which takes our results and then gives it to the right people to translate them into ocean literacy i say ocean literacy because i work on marine projects but literacy in general i think that would be very interesting just off off the top of my head thanks i'd like to add to that last part um we all have to write on the impact section in, in our proposals, and we all have to have indicators on the impact. But I was thinking whether we could also think about maximizing the impact across the projects. And I think that's more than the responsibility of an individual project. And, and we all come to our own limits in that. So, so I, I kind of have this this dream or or an idea that, that if the commission or another donor would be interested in creating this one-stop shop for all the output and lessons and processes like for instance we all probably developing guidelines and tools so we've got 46 projects with loads of guidelines and tools in different areas and they are very disparate around scattered out all over the place some are better than others some are more tailored some are more generic and and but to get that together and to make a synthesis of it or that, that we keep on learning from what past projects have gone, that I think that will increase also the quality of our science that when something is five years old, nobody looks at it, so we repeat it. That we should still be able to, to build up on the shoulders of those who've gone before. So I think this is a billion dollars question. <laughs> and uh, I assume that until now in all these decades, European Union didn't really find a solution of how to make the project continue their work because there is not no easy solution. But from my perspective, from my experience, I would say that um, the continuation of the project is basically impossible because of the way, because of the project logic. You have start, you have end, you have financing, and you have partners. Uh, of course, there is knowledge generated, and this knowledge can be passed on. And this knowledge can, of course, be used by different institutions, and also this knowledge can generate another project. And this is how the evolution of your project actually goes. So you learn something, and then you improve it and you get another project. Uh, of course, if this knowledge would go to the market, this would be even better because then the market mm -hmm. itself would make possible the, 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 the outputs to, to go on to the market. We have also possibility of the policy interest. This is done by the legislation. You have stick and the carrot. This is usually very, very effective but you have policymakers that they have to do some decisions. So if, if they would say that each city has to have nature-based solutions in certain amount, the cities will, will have to do it. Anyhow. 
uh, and the last solution would be so that uh, you creates a kind of body, for example, as it was GRC or a climate kick or something, as I mentioned before, that would uh, be horizontal one and that would take the results of the project and then have enough funds to replicate them. Thank you very much, uh, Darko. I think that was a very nice uh, summary of, of, uh, of what you had. I might maybe add one more. And I think it's also it's demanding more of us to really work across the disciplines and to maintain our curiosity to, uh, yeah, to understand this complexity. We're getting very close uh, to the end as we get quite lunch, but do we have uh, three waving their hand down here? Please, uh, we yes. have a question from the floor. Uh, thank you. It's more like, uh, well, thank the panel and information, I think, relevant for the panel and to all of us. So the European Geophysical Union will organize a session and now it's EU, don't be afraid, it will be a policy relevant also. Adaptation knowledge and solutions for climate resilient Europe from science to governance. So that will be in April. Okay, why I'm telling you about this is because it will feed into the sixth uh, European Climate Change Adaptation Conference in June, where there will be decision makers, practitioners, policy makers. It will, the EU session will feed in with the topics and messages to those people. I think we all in the end would like to reach. Thank you. Thank you very much. So uh, with that, I would very much like to, to thank all of our speakers in the panel, wonderful presentations, a lot of variety in the projects. Um, so a round of applause to all of our panelists, please. Thank you. And now we will break uh, for lunch, which will be just outside in the foyer as for the break. And I also invite you to look at the, the posters that are available and test out the, the virtual reality that will be uh, available as well. And continue the discussions um, with all of our, our panelists. I'm sure you have uh, many more reflections to, to share. So thank you. And we meet again back here at, at, at 3 o'clock. Yes, at three o'clock. Very well. Thank you.